ministering on the manifestation of the sons of God. That's been our emphasis for the last several weeks. And the whole concept of, of understanding who we are in Christ, this manifestation of the sons and daughters of God, totally depends upon our ability to understand our identity. Because it all comes from our identity. Jesus had to know who he was before he could minister among the people. And he spoke it. He not only... I, I believe growing up he realized who he was. And then whenever God led him into the ministry, he began to speak and reveal who he was. And um, he called himself the Son of God. He had to somewhere along the lines come to that conclusion. He had, because sooner or later he was going to have to act like the Son of God. If he is the Son of God, he's going to have to act like the Son of God. He called himself that. And he also said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Basically saying, I and the Father are one. And he's Emmanuel, God in the flesh, God with us. And so he had to know that. And he ministered out of that. And it's important, if we don't understand who we are as sons and daughters of God, we're not going to walk out who we really are. In fact, if we don't get a revelation of our identity from God, we're going to get it from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we're probably, to be honest, walking out some type of identity that's not even really who we are. I, I would venture to say, and I really hesitate to say this, but I really kind of believe this, is probably most of how we are today is not out of our true identity. We've picked it up upon lies, deception, ignorance, whatever. And we're walking out a life he never meant for us to walk out because it's not who we are. We, we, we've done this with our kids. A kid will act a certain way. That's not how I raised you. Or that's not who you are. That's not who we are as a people. We don't do that kind of thing. And we bring an adjustment to their behavior by letting them know that's not who we are. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit does when it says He convicts us of righteousness. Because every time we, we venture off the path or whatever, the Holy Spirit will convict us of who we are. The righteousness of God. This is who you're a son of God. You're the righteousness of God. This is who you are. And this is how you walk it out. By who you are. You're walking out who you are in your mind. And if you're happy with that, go for it. But if you realize this isn't it, this can't be it, then you're going to have to realign yourself with your true identity. That's what Christ did. He heard the Father say at times, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus lived out his identity. In fact, it's at this point where the devil struck his blow at. Because in the wilderness, he asked him three times, If you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, see, we always emphasize the temptation, right? When you hear about that, we always emphasize the three temptations, but really what happened prior to him tempting was questioning his identity. If you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, do that. And so that's where the enemy hit him because if he could question the identity, he may not be able to walk out his purpose if he could... If he could get him to doubt his identity. Well, maybe I'm not the son of God. I mean, I kind of realized, I thought that I was, but now up here in the wilderness with the devil, I may not be. If he would have allowed the devil to bring doubt to his identity, wonder what kind of a life Jesus would have lived. What kind of life are we living because the devil lies to us about who we are or are not? And so... This is where the enemy strikes at all of us by deception. Lies, half-truths. What did he do to Jesus? He <laughs> twisted the scriptures. He's going to do the same thing to us. Why? Because the devil comes as an angel of light. And he's not going to come say, hey, I'm about ready to tell you a lie. Just letting you know this is a lie. We're getting ready to tell you a lie. So you have the... He's not going to do that. He's an angel of light. He's going to come and making you think a certain... Well, one plus one equals two. That's, that's, I have this addiction. I must be this. I have this going on. I must be that. They told me I was this. I'm a loser. I'm this. And we just lock right into that. And that's who we portray in life is what the world, the flesh, 
based on all deception the devil gives us. Now, Eve had the choice to hear God as Adam and believe. And they did till the devil came questioning the voice of God. And they began to believe what the devil said, acted on that voice, empowering the words of the devil, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At that point, they lost their dominion on earth at that point through deception. And the devil takes it from that point on. Now, when God told Adam and Eve, and I'm, this is all introduction, when God told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth, he did it by giving them power and authority and dominion to frame what that world was supposed to look like. We'll never know what that world was exactly supposed to look like because of the fall. But they were the ones who were going to take the power and authority, the dominion given to them, and create this world, evolve it more into whatever it was supposed to be before the enemy came in and destroyed a huge plan of God at that point. So the universe was created by the word of God. God spoke what he believed. This is what God, this is the way God himself operates, calling those things that are not as though they were. He said light be, light was. And therefore that is how Adam and Eve was supposed to replenish the earth by believing and speaking. The way God did. See, when you read that in Hebrews 11, chapter 11, that God framed the world by what he spoke. That is the way God does things. And that's how he wants us to do that. Now, Jesus comes along in Mark 11, 23, and reiterates that by saying, if you say to this mountain, be removed, it will be done if you don't doubt in your heart. So isn't it, arrest, isn't it interesting that God told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth by hearing and speaking, because that's how God did it. That's how God created the heavens and the earth, by speaking. And then Jesus comes along after restoring it all back to us. He tells us to do the same thing. Speak and say what, how you want your world to be. If you don't want that mountain there, remove it. And that's where he comes and says, we, whatever you bind on earth, we bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Adam and Eve changed their entire world on this, believing the enemy, the words that he spoke, and the enemy coming in, deceiving them. And the whole world, the whole plan was completely changed at that point. Now, what? Now, now, again, this is introduction, but you're going to have to really listen carefully or because I'm trying to create a grid here for the end of the message. Because if, if I don't, you're... It's just going to be one of those little teachings that go, yeah, we heard it. Okay, we'll, we'll go all merry way. i got to create a grid in such a way that when you hear the end of this message, boom, it sets in. It's like concrete. It's wet right now. I'm creating a wet concrete. So whatever you set in it, boom, it's going to stick. That's what I feel like I'm doing in, by way of this introduction. So listen very carefully. Adam and Eve had the dominion. Now, you know, authority means that you have the right to use power. That's what authority means, that you have the entire right to use power the way that you want to use it. All right. So the enemy comes in there, screws that whole thing up, and now he has dominion. And the, their whole entire world changed. Now, I want to show you on the board basically what happened. So you got God up here in heaven. you got man down here on earth. And there's communication going on. Man is operating out of his spirit. And his soul, which is his mind, emotion, and will, is subservient to the Holy Spirit. So whatever the spirit of man is saying, the spirit, the soul is, is doing. And his body being neutral, the body's going to either obey the soul or the spirit. So the body's neutral. It's waiting to see who's going to rule here. And before the fall, the spirit of man ruled. Okay, we, We've been through this a million times. But I'm showing you something. Then you have tree of life over here, tree of knowledge of good and evil over here, and Satan waiting to make his move. Now, God works through the spirit of man. That's how he will always do. He did it at the beginning. And our mind, emotions, and will, our soul is subservient. It obeys what the spirit is, what God is doing in the spirit, and the body works it out in action. Okay, so God is ministering to the spirit. Satan is not going to go to the spirit because that's where, that's holy. That, 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 the spirit of man doesn't sin. That's how come God can operate there. 
So Satan's going to speak to the mind, emotions, and will. He's going to minister to the soul. Even to this day, if Satan's going to come at you, he's going to come through your mind, emotions, and will, not your spirit. Now, if you're unsaved, this is dead. Because God said if you eat from the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. Well, they didn't physically die. But their, their, soul, their spirit died, which gave the soul total rule and reign, which is the mind, emotion, which of course affects the will. And now they're, they're eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So unregenerate man has no choice but to live off of good and evil out of the soul. And Satan goes to the soul of man. God tries to get to the spirit of man. Once the man is born again, the spirit comes back to life. And our whole struggle, you and I to this day, is to try to get the soul to line up with the spirit. Because the soul still wants to dominate as, as it had done before you got saved. Does that make sense? Yes. And I know we've developed this a, a lot over the years. But I'm, I'm trying to show you where we're at. Because what happens here is at this point that when Adam and Eve fall... The enemy is going to come in there with his lies, with his lies and deception to the soul. And he's going to dominate now through the soul of man. He can't dominate without us. See, when God created this physical earth, now catch it. When he creates the physical earth, the only way a person can rule and reign in this physical earth is with a physical body. Demons can't do anything unless they possess a body, work through a body. Satan couldn't do anything on this earth. He didn't have the legal right. He didn't have a body. He was just a spirit. That's why God, God's spirit, we know that, right? God is spirit, and he creates a physical man on this physical earth, and he creates that physical man with a spirit because God's going to move through the spirit of that man to get stuff done, to replenish the earth at that point. So Satan could not just come in there and strong arm Adam and Eve. Number one, they had power and authority over him. So he has to lie and deceive them into eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thus creating the spirit of that man to die. And now the enemy is at that point going to rule and reign through man. Now I want you to get this. The devil is not ruling and reigning by himself. He can't. He needs people. If God would come down here right now and destroy everybody, Satan completely loses. Because again, what's he going to do with this earth? He's a spirit. What's he going to do on this earth? Satan, I mean, if God says, you know, Satan, God could win easily by wiping us all out and do a do-over. Wipe us all out. And here we've got Satan two, or in a third of the angels, which is now fallen, demons. What are they going to do? There's no one to afflict sickness on. There's no one to get him to sin. He loses without us. Are, are you, you, have you ever thought about that? He loses without <coughs> us. He needs us. He rules and reigns through us. So if we're believing his lies, he gets to rule and reign. But the minute we are opened up to, hey, that's not true. I'm not doing that. He's defeated. An unsaved person can defeat the devil simply by this. If the devil's got lies lying to an unsaved person and they come to some type of truth says, I don't want to do that no more, that area of their life, they win back. And the devil can't use that anymore. Yeah, they're still sinners, they're still going to hell, but that's an area that they've taken back for themselves because they've found truth somewhere along the ways that they're I'm not doing that no more. You know, people people unsaved people are always adjusting their lives. Changing their lives even for the better. But that's, that's, that's still from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's a good thing that they're doing, but it's still evil. It's still not from God. You know, so I hope that didn't confuse you on that issue. Now what am I saying here? This whole thing, you've got to understand that the devil needs people. He's not a ruler on his own. He can't rule by himself. He needs people to rule through. So we're kind of like hostages down here. Now let that sink in. And he needs, he needs deception. He needs lies. Otherwise, that's why he's an angel of light. Nobody's going to willingly follow the devil. So he's got to come through media. He's got to come through governments. He's got to come through 
ideologies. He's got to come through religious teachings. He'll come through whatever he's got to come through to, to, to brainwash the people with certain mindsets so he can empower those mindsets to do his will. Now, so he's got a, he's got a blueprint to get stuff done on this earth through us as God does. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says this. This is after the fall of man. This is what happened to our, to our identity. It says here, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. This is before you got saved. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Do you see that? We were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And who's speaking to the mind? Satan. And the body's neutral, so it's only going to do what the mind is being deceived into doing. So our desires of the body and the mind are being carried out. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So there's your identity after the fall. Completely blinded by the enemy. Now Jesus even said to some people, your father is the devil. So we got to understand that though man has dominion, he has been blinded by the devil, and the devil uses that blindness, the trickery, the deceit, to rule through man. Because he knows he needs man to speak, believe and speak. Believe and speak. That's how you take dominion. Believing and speaking. And so the devil comes with lies. So you believe a lie. Speak that lie. His will gets done through, through deceived people. God's will gets done through enlightened people. You follow this? Now, God's original plan. Go to Psalms 82.6. I want you to see this. This is how God still sees us, although we're in bondage to the devil. We're, we're, we're basically held hostage and we're blinded by the enemy. But in Psalms 82, 6, God says this. You are God's. This is how God sees you. Now we're talking about identity. The devil screwed up man's identity after the fall. I'm going to show you what man's identity is prior to the fall and even after Christ. When Christ came to restore all this stuff back to us. He said, you are God's and all of you, not some of you. Does it say all? Mm -hmm. All of you are children of the Most High. Now, that's who, now, the church for years has tried to explain away this scripture. But Jesus quotes this in the Gospels. Now, if it is supposed to be meant any other way, Jesus should have fixed that and said, now, nah, come on, you guys, we don't really mean gods. I don't know why, why David said that or whoever the writer of the psalm was. Let me fix that for you. No, he, he basically said, Did not, does not the scripture say you are gods? Now, however you want to see that, prior to Christ, I don't care. But what I do care is how you see that after Christ. We are in Christ. Now, we've, I, I, I have spent so much time developing that concept, that teaching, that you are in Christ. What's true of Christ is true of you. When God looks at you, he doesn't see where Christ ends and you begin. He sees you all as Christ. So therefore, if Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me, and I'm one with the Father, 1 Corinthians 6.17, and... John 14, 23, is they make their home in me. Does that not give me some divinity? I'm not saying I'm God, but I am part of the Godhead. That makes me a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God, which makes me God, a little G God. Because when you think like that, then you get, you get restored to you, your identity of dominion, power, and authority. But if you see yourself as a mere man, you see yourself as a worm, you know, not worthy, that's how you're going to live your life, taking the scraps the world gives you or what the devil can hand, throw at you. You'll, you'll, you'll just take it. 
We were made after the image and the likeness of God. Angels weren't. Angels were not made after the image and likeness of God. Angels are not given all power and authority. Angels weren't given the job description of rulership over this earth. We are. So we are created higher than angels. Created below Elohim, which is a bad translation when they says we were created a little lower than the angels. That's not the real Hebrew word. It's Elohim, which is the Godhead. So we were created a little lower than God, yet still remaining the little G of God. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not going to spend much time there. You do with that with what you want. But I'm going to show you at the end, Paul is trying to restore the rulership to us. And I'm going to look at that here in the, in the end. The whole purpose of Christ is to restore dominion, power, and authority to us. Now look at Psalms 115, 16. You may have never seen this scripture before. But you've got to do something with it. Now as we, now we're, we, we, our identity as you are God's. Sons and daughters of God. What now? As a son and daughter of God, what now? Okay, what does that mean to me? Look at Psalms 115, 16. He's going to tell you what it means. The heaven, even the heavens, are whose? Huh? The Lord's. So who's got the title deed to the heavens? God does. God's the owner of heaven. So that means you have no business thinking any type of rulership, power, authority over heaven. God has the title deed of heaven. What's the rest of that verse says? And the, are the Lord's. But the earth, he has what? He's given to man. Now how much more clear is that? Who did he give the earth to? Satan? He gave it to man, not Satan. Who do you think is ruling and reigning the most in this world today? Satan. Through man. Unregenerate man. Because remember, Satan can't do anything without a man. He needs a body because he doesn't have one. He's a spirit. He needs a physical body. So he, and he knows man has the dominion created after the likeness and image of God. They're children of God. So he has to lie to them, deceive them. So he can get his will, his will done. So God literally, listen to this. God literally gave the earth to mankind. God the creator gave us the power and authority to rule over this earth as if, as if we were the creator. Now, we weren't the creator. We know God was. But he gave us that much dominion that from this point on, we recreate our lives, redo, restore what the devil's taken from us. Once you get this, revelation, you got to step back and say, okay, now what have I allowed the enemy in, in my life? What, he's, what has he been doing? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it back with this renewed understanding of power and authority. And now again, authority is simply the right to use power. And you have that authority to use the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus came, of course, and restored that authority back to us. Now, what do we do with it? If we can't get past the point of Satan's deception, we're never going to get into the blueprint of God and be creative again and replenish our lives the way he wanted Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Satan is only, now I'm, I'm almost done with my, my introduction, but I want to say a few more. Satan is only functioning under human power and authority. Because without a body, he, he can't do anything. Is that, I hope you're getting that. He needs man's cooperation to get his will done. As God needs man's cooperation to get his will done. So looking at the board again, You've got God on one end, and I'm really simplifying this. You got God on one end, Satan on the other end, and man here in the middle. And you've got God, which is the kingdom of light, Satan, which is the kingdom of darkness, and man on this earth. And they both got wills, and God created man with the, with the ability to choose faith. Who's he going to have faith in? Just like Adam and Eve. Am I going to believe what God is saying to me? Or am I going to believe what the devil is saying to me? And whoever I believe, my life will be created after who I'm believing. My life is going to look like 
who I'm believing. This whole earth was changed when Adam and Eve decided to believe the devil over God. Your life is going to be completely changed when you line up your faith with what God is saying and not with what the world, the flesh, and the devil. See, I'll say well, not what the devil's saying. Right away you're like, well, oh, the devil's not lying to me. Yeah, he's an angel of light. You've never recognized it up to this point. He's not going to come saying, hey, get ready. Here comes a big lie. Like, like, like what part of our government wants to do. They want us to go over to, to these other countries and warn them when we're going to bomb them so they can all hide. I mean, that really works. We're, 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 we're going to continue bombing, but we're going to warn everybody that at noon today, we're going to bomb. So, there, so even the enemy can go hide out somewhere. That's not, the devil doesn't play like that. That's a liberal move. And the devil's not a liberal. He's not a conservative. He's just evil to the bone. And he's going to get you where it hurts you the most. He's going to lie where you're more susceptible to believe it. So he's not going to come at you and say, get ready, here comes a lie. He's going to come and you're going to go, there's truth right there. You're, you're going to actually say, that's truth. I believe that. If not, you're an idiot to say, that's a lie of the devil. But you know what? I'm going to believe it anyway. Everything you are and do is based upon your mind lining up with a series of truths and you've been acting on them. So we've got to change that. Once you understand that he, the devil has to lie to you before he can operate through you. So we've got to deal with the lies. How do you deal with the lies? No, you don't go try to unravel the lies. You start seeking truth and ask the Holy Spirit to show you truth. And as you get revelation, that's what we've been doing here for how many years? We just teach revelation. Because if I can teach revelation, the lies automatic. I don't have to deal with lies. I deal with truth that takes care of the lies. And that's what the Holy Spirit's designed to do is to deal with the lies. Now, Satan's not a superior power. We've been deceived, even by the church itself, into this mindset that Satan is a superior power. Giving him, thus giving him power and authority. Allowing him to wreak havoc on our lives. Half the time blaming God. Our theologies are all screwed up in the church today. And Christians are not catching this. And the result is that they, is that they start... See, once, once Christians start catching this, they're going to do what John 14, 15, and 16. Greater works. Using the name of Jesus. Speaking and all those things that he tells us to do. And that will get our lives back into alignment with God's blueprint. Now, every time we yield to sin or something negative, we're empowering the devil to do something in our lives. Not all the time, but that's how he moves, mind you. That's how he moves. To get you to think a negative thought, build on that negative thought, to get you to feel a negative emotion. And then he builds on that emotion like hate, offensiveness, Bitterness, oh yeah, now i got something to work with. Then he throws a lie in on top of that emotions, and I tell you, the emotions are powerful, and you know that they are. So he's waiting for us. So cause Satan can't do anything without in my life, in your life, without your consent and without your cooperation. I hope I've developed you to that point that you got it, because I don't have time to really go back and do a line upon line here. But he can't do, let me say it again, Satan cannot do anything in your life without your consent and your cooperation. So that means, and I know you're not, the world does not want to hear this and the church doesn't either. But if what I'm saying is true, and it is, that means you've got to take total blame for everything in your life. Are you ready to take that responsibility? That I have, I have allowed the devil to lie to me, therefore he got my consent. And you got my cooperation, and I am in the mess that I am because I let him do this to me. Because God didn't put you in this mess. God didn't cause your bankruptcy. God didn't cause your divorce. God didn't cause your sickness. God doesn't, doesn't cause this, this, this evil stuff in your life. And you could say, well, it's always been the devil. And you, you get away by saying, I have no power over him, so God must have wanted it to happen because he allowed it. No. God gave you power, authority, and dominion Meaning he doesn't, he doesn't allow anything. That's why I gave it to you. Come on, think, of, think this through. That's why you have power, authority, and dominion. So evil doesn't happen to you. So when evil happens to you, you can't blame the devil. That, that's what he's going to do. 
I mean, go, go, go buy a rattlesnake as a pet. And you may go one or two days without getting bit. And you may think, wow, that's a nice rattle. You know, I, I'm really happy with this thing. And then when it bites you, you get all out of bed out of shape. Like, what's the deal? It's a rattlesnake. It's going to bite. Sooner or later, it's going to bite. So you can't get mad at the devil in the sense of, well, and upon all the stuff on the death. That's what he, he's, he's designed to ruin your marriage. His evil intent is to get you to be poor and sick. So you can't, you, so God says, I know, I know what the devil's all about. So I'm giving man power and authority. When he put man in that garden, he didn't put him defenseless. He knew the devil was in that world when he created that garden. He knew the devil was roaming around the earth when he created man. And he knew that the devil would get the man like that if he didn't give man part of his likeness and image, which has to do with power, authority, and dominion. So therefore, what happened in the garden, who do you blame? Tell me a Christian who's never blamed Adam and Eve. How many want to go up and slap Adam when it's all said and done because of what he did? How many times have you heard people say that? So they, 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 they're right in that it's Adam and Eve's fault. But what about stuff in your life? Who's going to take the blame there? Oh, no, that was the devil. God, God allowed the devil to hit me. I'm, I'm innocent here. And we go on our merry way with a hit. Another bite out of our axe. Something other, some other evil thing happened to us. And we reconstruct our lives to fit the evil that just now bumped up against us. Now we've got to reconstruct our lives to fit this evil thing in my life now. Huh? And we're and, and, and it goes and it just goes on. Here's another evil thing we let in. Here's another evil thing we let in. And before you know it, we don't look anything like God's original plan for our lives down here. Jesus said, I've come to give you abundant life. So half of us are sick, not enough money, not enough this, divorced, that. All, I mean, come on, that's abundant life? Addicted to this, addicted to that? Hating this person, fighting with that person? That must be God's will. No, no. The power and authority was to get you to get that devil and all that evil out of your life so you can have an abundant life. But we don't know how to deal with the devil. We don't know anything about him to deal with him. We don't know who we are because our identities are skewed at this point. Now, some of us are waiting for God to deliver us. <coughs> we're, we're, we are champions at this. I'm waiting for God to deliver me from my addiction. I'm waiting for God to, to give me finance. I'm waiting for God to heal me. I'm waiting for God to do all this stuff. Folks, we've got to change that. There's no more waiting. You have power and authority to deal with it now. There's no more waiting. This waiting thing, and, I, and we caught this about three or four months ago, that there, may, there are some things you wait for. It's God's will being played out in your life. But when it comes to the devil beating the hell out of you, what are you waiting on? Well, I'm going to let the devil beat on you about six more months before I, God, deliver you. No. You've already been delivered. You've already been healed. You're already rich. He became poor that you might become rich. By his stripes we were healed. Past tense. See, everything's already done. So here we are waiting for God to deliver us. And here the whole problem is we're passive with the devil and our power and authority to take dominion. This is all passivity, folks. We are to blame for this. We, we're so passive with the devil. See, James says resist the devil. How much are you resisting? When's the last time you actually resisted in faith? Or not just saying it because you're just parroting what James says. But you actually used power, authority, dominion out of revelation of this and resisted the devil and actually spoke to a mountain and got it removed. Or did you just end up living with the thing? Or you're waiting for God to do something. And God says, I have done it all. That's why it's called a finished work. There's nothing more left for God to do. So many of us are waiting for God to deliver us when in fact God is waiting for you to rise up in your restored state of power and authority, waiting for you to exercise dominion. But you've got to see through this deception that the church has laid on us as well as the world that we are in Christ. We are God's. We've got power. We've got authority. And no more cooperation with the devil. No more believing his lies. Now, Paul says that we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And Satan is waiting for you 
Now watch this. Satan is waiting for your cooperation. You need to know that when you say something out of your mouth, you're empowering him. Because you are the one with power, authority, and dominion. He's using your power. He's using your authority. He's using your dominion because he doesn't have it. Do you understand that? He gets it through default. So when you say, man, I'm, I'm not feeling good, you, 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 now he, 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 you just spoke your own. He, he's putting it on you or however you want to see it. The bottom line is, however it's coming down the pike at you, the bottom line is when you speak it, you're sealing the deal. You're sealing the deal because you have dominion to be creative. To, to frame your world. And if you don't want sickness, you don't want poverty, you don't want these things, then you take your God-given dominion and speak to those mountains and remove them without doubting in your heart. And that doubt comes from the lies and deceptions of the devil and the world and your own flesh that, well, you're not really a God. No, you're not really this. No, you really can't speak to inanimate objects. No, you don't do this. You don't do that. And here we go down that road again I have, I'm so tired of being talked out of my dominion by the church and then you've got those who get to this point and this is something the Lord just showed me today actually I was going to, sh to share with it maybe next week but I'll give you a little bit of it today every guy that I've found on the internet they're dead now so you've got to find them on the internet they're not on TV unless some show plays a rerun of some past, past evangelist but I've found a, a handful half a dozen maybe of guys who knew their power and authority. They, these guys raised the dead. These guys were doing the works. So I thought, well, let me check out what they're saying. They had this message of power, authority, and dominion. But where they fell short was they thought they got it from religious works and obedience to the law. Because every one of them, and I've not found one yet who knew grace, who operated in that realm. And then you, wrote, then you think, okay, well, their faith in that launched them into signs and wonders, but they really missed it on the grace message. And I'm also tired of, and I say that in order to say this, I'm tired of watching the faith teachers on TV tell me to get this way through their prescribed principles and formulas. I didn't need a principle and formula to get saved. I'm not going to need a principle and formula to operate in my, out of my salvation. So this is the importance of getting the grace message down pat and the faith message down pat because after you get the grace and faith down pat, you move right into your power and authority and dominion. Because then the devil cannot question your identity. You're the righteousness of God. He can't question your power because you rule and reign by grace. Not by your disobedience or obedience. You rule by grace, unmerited favor. I'm going to end the, ser the sermon today with that. Now watch this. The church is passive. You and I have been passive toward the devil. It's got to stop. And you know when it is. How can I, I, I want to say this as kindly as I can. And the only way that I can is by prefacing it with this illustration. When Peter said to Jesus, you're not going to the cross. We're not going to let that happen to you. What did Jesus say back to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. You savor us not the things of God. If the enemy can't lie to you, he will come to you through your people. Mm -hmm. Friends, family, relatives, spouses, whatever, kids. He's going to come at you through those around you. And you... you if your wife... Or your husband makes you a cup of coffee. It's the best coffee brand. I just bought a coffee machine. Here it is, but it's laced with just the tiny tad bit of strychnine. Are you going to, for all peace sake, drink it? Or are you going to push that table back and say, Woman, what the hell are you trying to do here? What gives? I know you will. If you find out that woman's out to take your life or that man is out to steal your life, okay, marriage is over with. What's going on here, right or wrong? We are, we're passive, folks. This whole thing boils down to total passivity. Everything for the sake of peace. No, no, no. And the enemy gets in there through because I don't want to really, I don't want to come against them. I don't want to come against that person. I don't want to lose them as a friend. I don't want to, 
I'm telling you, you've got to get to the place where this passivity goes out the door and you make your stand on God's word and if it offends people, so be it. Because that's how he gets in. You don't understand, that's how he's getting in. If just a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I don't know how much more kinder I can be because I can really be crude in saying some things, but I'm going to leave it there. Now, this is in closing. There are two wills in the world today, not three. You've got God wanting to do His will. You've got Satan wanting to do His will. So everything you see happening, played out in life, right in front of you, is a result of people listening to one voice or the other. There is no third plan happening out there that's neutral in a vacuum. Everything's going to have its strings attached to God, or that thing's going to have its strings attached to the devil, one or the other. There's no other way to see this, biblically. Now, in your philosophy, you might see it differently. But biblically, everything you see on this earth. Now, from this point on, I've got five minutes left, ten at the most. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Everything you see played out is a result of one or two of those kingdoms. There is no third will being played out in front of you. All right? There is um, not things happening by chance. Because God's vocabulary, in God's vocabulary, you're going to find a word called coincidence in the Hebrew. They never, God never taught coincidence in the Bible. Okay? So there's no coincidence or that just happened by chance. Everything is happening after, out of those two kingdoms being played out here on earth. Hey, why do you think God said, pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is where? In heaven. Because if your will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven, then the will of Satan is being done. Alright, so there's two wills being played out, and man is the one who's empowering one or two of those kingdoms on this earth. Alright, two voices speaking. God speaks truth to man's spirit and liberates. Satan speaks to man's souls and deceives and puts them in bondage. And you and I empower the words we're hearing. If I hear Satan's lie and it comes as an angel of light, well, that must be true because I see it happening. Boom, he that, that word, that voice gets empowered. Same thing with God. If God speaks a revelation to you and you believe that and you begin to speak it, you empower God's blueprint in your life on that level. So here, here it is. We're, we're, we're a Heinz 57 group of people. There's some things I allow the devil to to allow his blueprint to be empowered in my life. And there's some things I allow God, to, I believe God, and empower him. So I've got a mixture of God's will being done and Satan's will being done. And that's why we've got all this stuff going on in our lives. Good stuff, but also bad stuff. What we want to do is remove the bad stuff by completely recognizing God and, and getting here in him, believing him over the devil. That's why Paul said that you wouldn't be ignorant of his devices. And his fear was that you'd be deceived like Eve was in the garden. All right. So what happens is, stupid us, and I include all of us here, we never knew we ultimately had the dominion that God has given us in order to stand against the devil, but instead we've been in this passive mode and letting hell unleash itself on us rather than the kingdom of God. So Jesus, again, told us to pray his kingdom come, which would trump the enemy's kingdom. So what in your personal life, is out of joint. What have you been lied into? What areas have you been deceived in? And what areas are you presently passive in where you really haven't taken a power and authority? Maybe because you didn't know the identity thing. Maybe that got skewed a little bit. Maybe you didn't completely... Well, I, I believe all of us understand. That. Here's what I think it comes down to. Most, it's passivity. It's not ignorance. It's laziness. When I say passivity, we're too lazy to pray, we're too lazy to stand and speak the word and, and take, maybe because we don't even believe it, I don't know. I, you have to figure out how and why you became passive. If it is because you didn't understand the power and authority, that's one thing. And you haven't been exercised dominion because of ignorance and lies and deception of the enemy, that's one thing. But if you say, well, I, I knew all this. You walk out of here today and you say, I knew all this, and you've got to realize it's passivity. It's, it, it's, it's got to be that. And maybe a little bit of both. Now go with me to Romans 5, 17. This scripture really came to life to me this morning. 
And now it makes sense. This, I had a real big, not a real big, but somewhat of a, I don't know if I could call it a paradigm shift or just a, an understanding of why God's been doing what he's been doing, teaching me up to this point. I'll, I'll share that here real quickly. But look at Romans 5, 17. Because of one man's trespass, that's Adam with, with Satan, death reigned through that one man. But much more will those who what? Receive the abundance of grace. That's your grace message. Faith and grace message. And the free gift of righteousness. There's your identity. What happens? When you understand grace and faith and get your identity back. What happens? How's he finish that out? You reign. You reign in life. Through Christ. And the Amplified says reign as kings. Because reigning always has to do with power, authority, kingship. That's why the Amplified put kings in there. Because Paul said, listen, the only way the church is going to truly reign is when they finally understand the grace of God. And their identity as the righteousness of God. Because, see, the enemy can't lie to you when you have that revelation of righteousness. You're in Christ. There's nothing he can say to you anymore. When you're hidden in God, in Christ, there's nothing he can do. And if he tries, oh, if you really are righteous, you know, rather than saying if you are the Son of God, if you are righteous, why are you doing this? If you are righteous, why is this happening? You say it doesn't matter what's happening in my life. I am, by faith, the righteousness of God. That's a free gift God gave me for faith, righteousness. It's a settled deal. I'm righteous not by... Satan can pick out every area of my life where I sin. Rub my nose in it, and I'm going to come up out and go, yeah, that's right, but I'm still the righteousness of God. Because he said so, for faith, not by my works. So I get that under my belt, my identity. Then I understand the grace of God that everything is by unmerited favor, not by the works of the law. So he can't, he can't put the Ten Commandments in front of me. He can't put um, any type of laws or my disobedience or not enough obedience you can't raise the dead. You haven't obeyed enough. You, have, you can't raise the dead. You haven't fasted enough. See, all that goes when you understand the grace of God. Then when you understand your identity, which is the righteousness of God, and then you understand the grace message, you reign. The result is what? Power, authority, and dominion is restored back to you, and you get out of the passive mode. You get out of the ignorance mode, and you start operating and the enemy has nothing, nothing on you at this point because Christ has done it all. So when Jesus said he's coming back for a glorious church, he's going to come back to a church that understands the grace message. Not just what the pseudo grace message, but really understands the grace message. So I'll tell you when you understand the grace message, when they start accusing you of cheap grace because you made the legalist mad. And when they start calling you, you're giving people a license to sin. Because that's what they did to the Apostle Paul. That's why he said, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? That's their, that was their accusation to him. When you know you've got the grace message right, is when people will tell you you're preaching cheap grace and license to sin. Then you know you got it right. Mm -hmm. If you don't get those accusations against your life, I doubt that you really understand grace. You're still butting up against the legalist. Now watch this. When I got this message back in the late 80s, of the glorious church, a church that will rule and reign. I didn't have the grace message completely. I was on my way of getting it, but I didn't definitely have it. When it came to faith, no. God had to restore to me the grace message. And then the, the proper faith message aligned up with grace. Not faith without grace. And then you get into legalistic works. Then I began to pastor a church in the early 90s that didn't gravitate toward a glorious church message. When I mean glorious church, church triumphant. We win. We win. We're ruling and reigning in this life. That's what I mean by a glorious church message. So then I kind of regressed a little bit. Then when I got the message back, where I began to develop it again, I became pastor of that particular church and started operating and, and speaking messages that um, would put us on the right path of overcoming, not only as individual people, but as a church. And then, of course, the enemy came and, and um, devastated the whole thing because I believe that when people finally get this message is when they're going to get attacked the most. Why? 
He has the power and authority now. Once you take it back, realize that it was all already yours, that you've been playing the fool by him, the puppet, then you, that's when he gets mad. Because now you're taking back territory he took in your life, and that's his whole problem. His, his whole thing was is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so when you take that authority and power back, that's when he starts attacking the most. So I know for a fact, when I start operating in this manifestation of the sons of God more fully, that's when the attacks are going to come more fully. And if I don't have the grace message and the righteousness message and this whole thing we're talking about, the glorious church message, um, he's going to find an area and he's going to take you down. Because that's what he did with me in around uh, 96 or so. And so I had to go back for the last 13 years plus and say, okay, let's go back to the grace message. This, that's the only thing that's going to save me is this grace message. Then he began to develop the faith message alongside the grace message that I didn't have. I didn't fully have the grace message, but I didn't have the faith message. Then he began to restore both of those back. And then around 2010, 2009 actually, the Lord started leading our messages to go back to this glorious church emphasis. And if you look on the, on the, on the internet, you'll see the messages, how they, how they began to start changing in this, in this area. And then 2010, you know what happened. I got attacked again. It took me out for about a year and a half because now I had to go back to grace to get my life restored and renewed, get, get my mind back, create a new normal for me and all that because um, all the devastation the enemy you, um, did to my life. And then it wasn't just till the last year that the Lord said, okay, let's go back where we left off. Because I'm t And I said all that to say that he doesn't want you to get this. When you come close to even getting it, He's going to hit you so hard so you'll go, oh, that doesn't work. Or, or, or get you your focus on something else and, and he steals the seed of a glorious church message where you rule and reign in power and authority and dominion. Understand this is where we're supposed to go once we understand grace and faith. And according to Romans 5.17, that's what it is. Reread 5.17 today. Meditate on that. And you're going to see that's what we've been doing since this church started in 1998. We have been de developing grace and faith, grace and faith, grace and faith. And boom, getting ready to go into where does that lead us? To rule and reign in this life. And that's where we're going. What's good is grace and faith if we're not ruling and reigning in life? What good is grace and faith if the devil still has his hostage? Lying to us. Amen? Let's stand. Thank you, Lord.